After praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending immense greetings and salutations upon the final Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. We find a discussion today about the state of our youth of the current decline of specifically the Muslim youth. We find there are certain topics which have been touched upon at times centuries ago about what takes a person at the fold of an Islam. And amongst those elements that take people out of an Islam are ten major principles that the scholars have collected. Awwal that we find al ishraq billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala to commit shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that should be highlighted firstly because we know that many of us Muslims have a cultural belief and cultural practices that our belief at times is tainted with shirk and the Quran tells us وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ Most people believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but unfortunately they are committing shirk in their belief. So a person who does not find the correct belief has a corrupt belief is following a dangerous way of life and eventually could be dismantling their belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and could end up being a disbeliever. After that we find the practicing or the implementation of a sihr, magic, which unfortunately is another common practice in our culture, that people who study and use magic for whatever purposes it may be. The studying and the learning of magic is also something that breaks your faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or breaks your al-Islam whether that be white magic or black magic, any form of sorcery, witchcraft, spells, incantations that we find, are all things that dismantle the belief of the Muslim. Likewise, we find other things that may not concern us today about aging the disbelievers against the Muslims, or we find believing in a methodology or sharia and law, other than law given to the Prophet Muhammad as is applicable, or the teaching of Islam are barbaric or medieval, etc. These are all elements that can break your belief in an Islam. What concerns us today is point number 10, whereby some of the scholars have mentioned an deen in Layy subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person who turns away from the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, la yutabbiquhu wa la yuta'allamuhu person doesn't implement the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and doesn't bother to learn it. Takes no interest to learn about their faith. This is something written centuries ago that many ulama have concluded a person could be treading on a path of dismantling their Islam. That they are eventually falling into the trap of becoming a disbeliever if they do not seek to learn the deen of Islam and implement it in their lives. That is sadly 
the state of many of our Muslim youth. Many of our Muslim youth, they think that being born a Muslim or having some form of Muslim affiliation, that my father attends the masjid, my mother wears the hijab, my younger brother memorizes the Quran, or a certain family member has done this action, then that is enough for me. That shows that I am a committed Muslim. And this is a dangerous belief of turning away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Quran mentioned, Whoever turns away from my dhikr, my remembrance, will have a restricted life. And that is the main focus we want to place upon of turning away from the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are three types of individuals that we find who turn away from the message of Al Islam. The first type of individuals that we find are the so called academics. Muslims amongst us who believe that the only way forward for Al Islam is the concept of academics, of good skills, of a good education. That's partially true. We need to gain a good education and have a good skill in our lives. But Islam isn't just based upon academia or based upon theology. Islam is based upon implementation, that a Muslim implements what they learn in their life. So these Muslims are falling into this trap of modernism, of just believing that the only way forward for us Muslims is via education, and misunderstood the teaching of Al Islam. And these people may towards the end of their life, a later stage may begin, and we pray to return back to the orthodox views of Al Islam. So these are those individuals who begin to question the Sharia of Allah and the Allah, who begin to throw doubts about the Sharia of Allah and the Allah. It's common. We should not be offended by non-Muslims posing questions about the Islamic attire, about the Muslim woman's hijab, the niqab, the dress sense, the praying, the fasting. That's normal for them. Because for them, they're not used to these practices. The person shouldn't be offended by them posing these questions. What should offend a Muslim is whereby fellow Muslims are throwing doubts upon Al-Islam. And our message to those individuals is quite simple. If you don't want to practice something of Al-Islam, then do not become a deterrent or one who is preventing other Muslims from practicing something that they find is applicable to the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad or something of the practice of his wife or his companions. That is a symbol of a good Muslim. That I think I have some deficiency in practicing something, but there's nothing wrong in these people practicing these actions because of what they studied or what they understood from the Quran and the Sunnah. The second type of group of Muslims that we find are those who are inside the middle. Neither here, neither there. Those who are beginning to take a new interpretation of Islam or trying to you know, infuse both concepts. Whether it be the Shisha cafe that we find and Islam and music and Islam and free mixing, Islam and this that we find that begins to something to begin to promote can't make up their mind. One minute they are practicing Islam, the next minute they are practicing something else. Neither here, neither there. Or trying to stay away from studying the deen, whereby they know that the appropriate message may be delivered to them, and trying to stay away from that. Because they don't want to, they say, practice too much. That's another group of Muslims, unfortunately, that we find that I don't want to come, because I may be learning too much, and I may need to practice what's been taught to me. So they begin to find what they say is a softer message a more lenient message that suits them. La ilaha ulai wa la ilaha ulai Neither here, neither there. Mudabdabina bayna zalik is the verse begin with. If I am not in one of the two locations, can't make up their minds. And whoever of those kind of sends us straight, well, as Mr. Jidra Abu Sabila, that individual will not be able to find the path. The third group of individuals that we find is the masses of our Muslim youth. You find in the Mori Paul survey that was carried out, 31% or so Muslim young youth said that most of the Imams are clueless about what takes place on the road or on the streets. They don't have a clue. They don't know what our lifestyle is, they don't know our language, they don't know our culture, they don't know anything that's taking place around them. That is possibly true. Many of the Imams inside this country are clueless about what is taking place amongst the Muslim youth, the, the life of crime that they live, the obscenities, the haram actions that they carry out, many people are unaware, many parents are unaware. They think that their children are living a decent life or doing something good or something which is nothing too bad. Because some of us may live as an ostrich, just dig our heads down into the ground and ignore the wider community around us. So today our aim is to focus upon these third group of individuals 
And sometimes they try to use the excuse that nobody has delivered the message to me. The Quran mentions us inside the beginning of Surah Ibrahim, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ We do not send any messenger except for the language of these people to explain to the people. That's the role of the messenger to explain to the people the language that they understand. Thus many of our masjids are still debating whether the khutbah should be in Urdu, in Punjabi, or Gujarati, or Bengali, or whatever language should be in. Most people don't even speak these languages fluently anymore. The masses of people walking in Salat al Jum'ah, walking and they walk out, and no message is given to them. The same old message is delivered to them. So our task is hopefully, inshallah, to deliver the right message with a language that concerns them. Like the Quran mentioned, for every people there has to be a warner that comes to them. That Sheikh Samir Taymiyyah mentioned that the warner comes to deliver with the language of the people, with the understanding of the people. That is what the preacher should be doing. Preaching the message to the people according to what they understand. Like what has been attributed to Imam Ali, speak to people according to their intellect, their rationale, their mindset the things that they're able to understand. So these are the things that we want to address, inshallah, those common things that concern the masses of the youth, that some of us may shy away from and think, well, the youth are not involved in this. Or some of us may think, is it really possible that Muslim youth are doing these type of actions? So amongst the fitten of the youth that we find, that many of the youth are beginning to get involved, is obviously the type of fitting that we find are dangerous. The first type of fitna that we find is the concept of alcohol, the drinking of alcohol. And we know that inside this country they're always talking about the threat of terrorism and the threat of this, that and the other. According to their own sources, the biggest threat inside this country is alcohol abuse. That is the biggest threat upon this country. The government spends billions, billions a year to control the problems of alcohol abuse. That's a fact. In London, the Metropolitan Police had their, their way, they would make alcohol haram. They will make it haram, they will ban alcohol. Because every, not even Friday night or Saturday night, nearly every single night, the amount of taxpayers' money which is wasted on brawls, on abuse, on violence, on crime. It's been proven statistically that nearly every single crime inside this country has been infused by the use of some form of abuse of alcohol has taken place. Whether it be murder, whether it be rape, whether it be a mugging, whether it be whatever it may be, it always returns back to alcohol. So the first thing that we find that very strongly the Quran mentioned about the use of al-khamr. Some Muslims may think that you know the Quran takes a soft leading of view towards alcohol. Quran says inside Surah Al-Ma'ila, the fifth chapter, verses 19, 91, Ya Amanu, Shaytan. Or you believe in the drinking of alcohol, in intoxicants, throwing of, the, of gambling, throwing the divine arrows, sacrificing on the stones, is all the filthy handiwork of the devil. Stay away from it if you want to be successful. Thus Islam says that anything linked to alcohol is haram. Ten individuals are cursed in the hadith of Sahih Muslim. Ten individuals. The one who picks the grapes, the one who crushes the grapes, the one who transports it, the one who serves it, the one who sits on the table, the one who drinks it, the one who takes the wealth from it. All of these people are cursed according to Sharia. Al-Khamr is haram. And obviously they may try to paint a picture where it's only you Muslims who believe in this view. In the 1920s, the blessed United States of America classified alcohol as haram. Alcohol was haram in the 1920s. If you go and read the whole history of the mafia industry, the bootlegging of liquor that began to take place amongst the Italian mafia that began to take place was trafficking of alcohol. Because alcohol became haram in the 1920s, the only way to bring alcohol was to go underground. So these people began to traffic alcohol. But because they never had the iman, once again, they can legalize alcohol once again. As far as Muslims are concerned, this is an, the filthy handiwork of the devil. And that's why, find, unfortunately, Muslims they say, well, I don't drink, I just serve alcohol to non-Muslims, I have a fully licensed restaurant or whatever it may be. And you can see if you go down the various streets that we find, whether it be Manchester, Wilmslow Road, or whether it be in East London, Brick Lane, that you find.